Okay, moving right along, our next speaker is Bill Martin. He's principal at Martin Energetics and also the California GEO incoming uh, president and uh, board chair. Uh, Bill Martin is a retired 35-year instructor from Feather River Community College in Quincy, where his pinch-hitting teaching assignments included forestry, biology, computer applications, solar applications, energy-wise construction, and business. He is a veteran heat pump user as far back as 1977 and has designed and built three houses and two remodels. In the 80s, he taught an RCS auditing and a Title 24 regulations and is a certified geothermal loop installer. His latest project is a Z&E effort that will be covered in today's session. He joined California Geo Board in 2013. Uh, and then one caveat, anybody in the room with a green tag is with California Geo. If you have any questions or, or any, any needs throughout the day, please feel free to contact any one of us, pull us aside, punch us, whatever you have to do to get our attention, we're here for you. And with that, Mr. Bill Martin. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here behind uh, Mark and Diane. I really appreciate it. There's nowhere I'd rather be. There's no topic I'd rather be discussing with all of you. Uh, I'm very passionate. Uh, I have a lot of opinions, you'll see some of them. But uh, uh, true disclosure, this is the way I see it. This is not an insistence that this is the way it is. Uh, making that choice is up to you, and I hope that you will join us in our definition of zero net energy without carbon as an organization. I'm trying for that in my house, and you'll see more of that. Uh, we have a definition that we like at California Geo, which uh, keeps us away from carbon for zero net energy. And I want to talk to you about predicted extensions in Title 24, a topic that has been close to my heart for a long time, but I've, I fear that we're veering off some of the original pathway, and we're doing this at the risk of hurting our goals that we've established in state laws, executive orders, and in regulatory efforts. So uh, I'll be talking about that. And last, I'd like to show you what I've done at my house, which is my be-all, end-all, last house, I'm going to die there kind of a thing. And uh, it uh, teams solar PV with uh, geothermal heat pumps underground. So get the right button. There we go. So uh, what is California Geo's definition of true zero net energy? What does it contain, depend on, and what can it achieve? It contains renewable energy. It contains geothermal heat pumps, the most efficient equipment on the planet for moving BTUs using electricity to drive it. And it, uh, it involves solar PV and solar thermal, and it doesn't involve carbon. Uh, it depends on making the best policy choices, the congruent regulations that we need, advanced building codes that are going to take us from, you know, the old style, let's make the envelope pretty good, to Let's try and make it better and better and better to foster ZNE without as much mechanical equipment. And it needs a strong, flexible electric grid. And that, that is a difficult problem. Uh, you know, the more renewable solar we put on during certain parts of the day causes a huge ramp up at the end of the solar day. And there are a number of strategies for dealing with that. And I have a, a paper uh, on uh, ZNE that's on the face of my website that if you want to look at it, I feature some of the 10 strategies that have already been covered by Carl Linville of the uh, renewable, uh, sorry, the uh, regulatory assistance project. And uh, there are real solutions, some of which have been talked about today. Uh, it can achieve a waking of the public. So the public thinks more green, wants to be more green than they already are. And in this state, a lot of the public an increasing number of uh, folks want to be green, they just don't know how. That's part of why we push ZNE. We want to show them how and show that it's off-the-shelf technology. It's available today. There's no reason not to start. Uh, we want to engage the stakeholders, make progress on existing statutes that say, hey, we're going to have fewer greenhouse gases. Really? Well, we better do something about that. And we want to finalize the best regulations. So here is California Geo's definition of zero net energy. A ZNE code building is one where the actual energy produced on site through renewables is equal to the building's energy use over an entire year. The grid and the ground serve as our electric and our thermal batteries, and no carbon-based fuels need to be pumped, trucked, leaked, or combusted. So that's a tall order, but it is achievable. 
Uh, here is the TDV base definition that the CEC and the CPUC are using. I don't care for it. The origin of some of these terms within it that are highlighted are found in these uh, brackets below in these links. And this presentation will be posted on my website and also the California GEO website with many of the other speakers as soon as we can make that happen. So if you'd like to dial in to martinenergetics.com, you can find uh, this, this and some other papers on the, on the home page waiting for you. Uh, here's a little bit more about that definition. Uh, societal value of energy uh, is not a clean definition to me. Uh, Time-dependent valuation is a, uh, uh, it's a changing variable. And I think it belongs in the utility grid system. The utility can decide what's the value of producing energy, keeping the voltage up on the grid as we go along, and we'll work that through rates. What I don't want to see is time-dependent valuation polluting building codes so that what we try and do with a building we build in 2020, when all residences are supposed to be Z and E, I don't want that metric to be different in 2020 than it's going to be in 2025. I don't want it to be the same as it was in 1978. I want us to work with hard numbers and calculations that don't fluctuate over time. So I would prefer to get all the subjective elements out of this. It looks like my arrows got a little, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I've, got a lot of, I've got a lot of slides and we're short on time, so I'm going to blow through some of this, and uh, I beg your forgiveness. If you end up at any point in seeing a, a slide that you want to hear more about or ask a question, there's a number of the slide at the bottom of the slide, and uh, you can uh, refer to that. Uh, so I think this definition that's currently on the book, shall we say, uh, preserves a fossil forever. It's toward that kind of a strategy. And I don't think that's a strategy that our laws and regulations have already established, starting with the, uh, 20, the 2006 uh, greenhouse gas laws, AB 32, and some of the other uh, executive orders by Governor Jerry Brown. I, I don't think we want to go in that direction. Is TDV going to give us too slow a path to Z&E? I think so. You think all new housing construction is going to be Z&E by 2020? That's less than five years. What I see out there right now tells me it's not going to happen. It can happen by that time. You've got to have goals. Uh, sometimes you don't achieve them on schedule. You've got to keep trying. I love Mark's goals. I hope that we get there sooner rather than later. I do believe that it is achievable. It's, but if we don't start now, it's like compounding and investments for your retirement. If you wait till later, <laughs> you've got to invest three times the money. So let's invest. Let's start now. Let's not wait till it's too late. One of my bugaboos about fossil forever philosophy is if we keep going in that direction, we are preserving the business models of those who have a profit incentive to keep selling us fossil. That's just fine, but it doesn't fit our policy goals. I'd like to decouple that. I also don't like political subversion. And I'm not blaming anybody that's directly selling you know, gas through utilities, but if you look at what has happened in this state, just the actions to try and un undermine AB 32, it's not acceptable to me. Uh, we got the fear appeal all of the time. We, the voters, 62 to 38 percent said, no, we are, we are going to support AB 32. We are not going to suspend it for some period of time. $75 million was spent in the campaign, and honestly, the, the people uh, on the environmental side outspent the, uh, the fossil contributions. But, um, boy, I would love to have 50 million of that 75 million drill a lot of boreholes in the ground and hook up to the thermal battery of the earth and install a lot of ground source heat pumps, geothermal heat pumps. I could do so much. So rather than fighting about politics, the society and the political was mentioned by Mark as one of our biggest barriers. And you know, it's, it's a barrier you can't necessarily fix. You can't, you can't ex, uh, exert three units of energy toward that and get one unit of benefit. You just don't know the way the wind is going to blow. And that's one of the difficulties, the frustrations. Um, AB 69 almost uh, delayed our involvement in the uh, program for uh, cap and trade for transportation fuels that did go in on schedule in January, but it was a, it was a close one. We had a lot of fear appeals by, uh, by AstroTurf organizations, not real grassroots organizations. And uh, you know, again, this is part of the subversion I do not care for. What is happening to my clicker? Right-hand side, right? There we go. Okay, so I believe that 
the definition that I prefer for zero net energy without carbon uh, gets us the following things on the points of the star. It's a better path to be following. It's something that takes us closer to the direction that Mark has outlined for us, and uh, I hope that we can do some of this. Okay, so what has the CEC in Title 24 already done for us? And this is where I praise the Energy Commission and the work that's been done and Title 24 as a mechanism. I think it's been one of the marvelous things around. So here's a little history about electricity growth. Back in 1972, the RAND Corporation noted the doubling time of electric generation that was needed. And we were doubling uh, at a rate of every 8.5 years. So if, if that was, you know, if today was a doubling time, we're dealing with 43,000 megawatts uh, peak load in the summertime on a, on a hot day. Just imagine starting to double all of that kind of thing. It's, you, can't, you can't get there from here. So we ended up, uh, you know, what would happen if we had five doubling times until right now? We, uh, you know, every 8.5 8 years from 1972, 42 and a half years, we'd be right at middle point in last year, and we'd have all of those additional power plants to provide our electricity. The reality is it's getting pretty well known that we in California are 50% uh, less than the per capita use of electric energy nationwide. I think this is a remarkable record. Uh, and I think back and, and to the insults that were thrown toward our governor and calling him certain names. And when he mentioned that smaller is beautiful and those sorts of things, and we ought to be conserving energy where we can, uh, he was ridiculed for it. And yet the plan and the rollout from that and the creation of the Energy Commission has taken us all this way. And it's a, no other state can claim this record. I don't know about other nations, but it's been a great job. And as a result, we are not dependent upon an ever-expanding group of power plants we're in a better position to start making a transition to something that is more renewable. Um, the newer codes, the 2013 Title 23, Title 24 regulations are currently being updated, as well as the 2016 codes are being built. They're predicted to go online in 2017. Our group has been somewhat involved in this in the last couple of weeks and went to a, a seminar webinar about it. And the problem we have with it is the new Title 24 regulations are making an exception for gas. If you read the regulation proposals and you listen to the people just two weeks ago, uh, new homes in 2020, when we say we want zero net energy, are going to be using gas and they're not going to be doing something else. I think that's incongruent with the goals the state has set, and I would rather not see that. And in my case, Elimination of electric resistance water heaters inside gas regions takes away the benefits of ground source heat pumps with these superheaters while producing more carbon emissions. Um, you know, that kind of kills off the retrofit market in the greatest part of the state. I'm not in natural gas territory, but um, there are other elements in these regulations that would make it illegal for me to get a building permit for the house I finished in 2014. So. Uh, we're, if we're headed for a largely carbonless economy with lots of electric vehicles charging at home and elsewhere, why fiddle with gas? And just last night, Paul Boney and I walked the promenade over here and happened to happen into a Tesla store. And, uh, you know, I'm interested. I'm not going to go buy one. It's out of my price range. But uh, very interesting to get up close to the technology and take a look at it. They evidently are going to put a lot of charging stations around. And not too far away from me in eastern Reno, they're going to build a large battery plant. So a modest-sized ground source heat pump with solar PV and solar thermal can keep timer-controlled resistance heating for hot water uh, to a very small load. And we can do that without carbon. So why, why would we not do that? Why put gas in buildings beyond 2020 when the clear goal of AB32 is to eliminate it? And uh, there are carbonless alternatives off the shelf right now that can do this. Uh, my heat pump and de-superheater are working very, very well, and uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So if we distribute more gas, we're going to have potentially more leakage. We are more uh, involved in consumption of fossil-based energy, and we produce more CO2. Uh, gas is not a renewable, and it continues our dependence on a fossil fuel. I am not in favor of going to houses that exist and ripping out their gas. I want to make that clear. I believe in utilities. I am a director on a water and sewer utility in my own community. I think I understand rates. I think I understand representing the public. Uh, I don't want to tear anybody's gas out. I just want us to not keep using it if we say 
we're going to build ZME buildings in the future. The building stock will last hundreds of years. Then let's make it renewable from the start. Okay, so here are some other issues for us in the geothermal industry, and that is the Title 24 currently does not have a mechanism that would allow us to be incorporated for permit approval under Title 24. So the house that I legally started constructing in 2012 and finished in late 2014, if my building department enforced the regulations that I have shared with you, the elements of by the Energy Commission, my house could not be permitted. And yet my house is heading for zero net energy without carbon. Now, wait a minute, does that make sense? I can make it happen on my site and I can be net even with the utility, maybe even export a little bit on an annual basis. But because of these technicalities, I might be illegal. I'm really glad my loops are in the ground, the insulation's in my walls, and my heat pump is installed. But that's, that's too much of a defeatist attitude. I want to preserve the option for such housing for other people. So if GHPs are the most efficient, why can't we simply accept envelope uh, verification and nameplate performance of the equipment? We can heat space and we can heat water at COPs near five, sometimes greater. And uh, I, don't, I don't see why we shouldn't start doing that. Uh, in colder heat, day or night, GHP's performance is steady. And you see here a couple of temperature maps, one in extremely cold situations, one in extremely hot situations. And in both of them, I would rather be dumping heat into 65 to 70 degree ground or pulling heat from, uh, you know, 45 degree water than to be trying to do it with an air to air heat pump. So here's where I live. It's in the eastern edge of the Sierra in Quincy, the metrics of what the climate are here on the right. It is a uh, heating dominant climate for certain. And uh, 5,852 degree days is not Minneapolis, but it is double plus what is in Sacramento. So it, there's some challenges there. And here's what I have at my house a conventional construction with enhanced envelope and efficient lighting. Uh, heat load is less than 20,000 BTUs per hour at 10 above zero, the design temperature in the ASHRAE tables. My heat pump is a two-ton with a two-speed compressor, very common arrangement, and it has three zones to drive my 3,265 square feet of conditioned space. I run about 94% of the time on stage one, 67% of compressor capacity. So I'm almost never on stage two. Um, I have uh, a, a way over-engineered loop that I did myself, but because I'm in the world's worst soil, as you will see, here's how the envelope looks. Uh, the diagram in the center shows you that it's a double offset stud wall on a two by eight plate. Thermal bridging does not occur. Influence from the outside wall surface moving through wood, soft wood, framing wood, which is our two point, sorry, 1.25 per inch, dies in the middle of the insulation. Heat from the inside surface of the wall, moving outbound through a two by four, dies in the middle of the insulation. So with the exception of the double top plate and the bottom plate, there is no thermal bridging in the building. Now where you start to frame against windows and doors, you end up with two by fours on both sides of the plate. But even then, you have a space that's a thermal break between the two by fours front and back. And you can clearly see that space uh, in the uh, slide over there. I have good windows. They're not the best in the world, but they're, they're good. And so with that, I end up with a, an envelope that's uh, very tight and doesn't lose a lot of heat. I used a blow-in JM Spider fiberglass. I liked it. it. It puts about R30 in the wall space. I probably credit that wall with about R33 through the opaque wall, not the glass. Uh, here's my kitchen lighting, and I'll make the disclaimer, anybody taking a picture with a digital camera or a phone, uh, it looks brighter than it really is. However, it does show you where the lighting sources are. This is my kitchen. It's 260 square feet. There's 225 watts of total capacity, but 70% of that is dimmable. And, I'm, you know, I couldn't get my wife to accept running around at night with each of us having a headlamp on. Hi, honey, I see you over there. Um, my first wife, I tried to get her to go with portholes on the outside wall, but that did end in divorce. So uh, I guess that tells us something about that relationship. So good, thank you. 
So uh, here we are, 225 watts. Uh, everything in here is LED with the exception of T5 fluorescents under the cabinets. They're very small. We, we never run with everything on, but uh, you know, I'm usually at half, half dim on both, both of these things. So I have air-to-air air -air heat pump experience on the far left in the 77 house I built. The AHRI temperature for testing air-to-air -air heat pumps is uh, 47 and a half degrees on the on the warm side, but it's also 17 degrees on the on the cold weather situation. And in my climate, I can tell you that my heat pump spent too much time for me on defrost because you get moist air that's cold and it ices up on the coils, and you know you go into resistance mode to satisfy the thermostat. Uh, those kinds of heat pumps, air source, are above 2.77 now. They're over three. That's fine. But I prefer on the right. What I'm working with is on uh, stage one capacity. I'm at 4.9 COP. That's as long as my entering water temperature is at or higher than 41 degrees. And I'll show you the results of that. And here's my solar going down last November. And so I have uh, solar to power what is going on. And so uh, when I run cooling, uh, with my heat pump arrangement, uh, I'm pulling less than 1,800 watts. So that's the connection to the picture of my wife's hair dryer. Her hair dryer on full blast uses more than 1,800 watts. But one of my heat pumps using it, uh, I can do 25,000 BTUs of cooling and 3,300 BTUs of hot water preheat. I like that. Uh, my house is, you know, that's what it looks like. And down here is the, the, the big miracle, the one I really like. Here's a cross section of a heat exchange loop inside the heat pump where the water from the ground uh, meets on the other side of a pipe from the refrigerant in the heat pump system. That's where the miracle happens. That's where we evaporate refrigerant to later compress it to make heat. It's also where we condense it uh, so we can carry the heat away in the water in the summertime. So it's uh, a great system, makes it easier on the grid. Maybe you know that 0.7 kW per ton of ground source heat pump capacity is reduced from standard air conditioning or air-to-air -air heat pumps. That's good for utilities. Okay, my soil is awful. It's to the left, and it, it was uh, pulled out and uh, run through a grizzly with a four by four inch screen. The soil on the right is uh, another job that I supervised in the same valley, but you can see how nice the dirt is. I don't have that. I have what's on the left. So I had to go through some, uh, you know, there, there's, there's my soil uh, on underneath the excavator. That's about the third grab. You can see how much is there. And the soil sample test that was done because I am a subdivision and I had to get, you know, that done by an engineering firm, uh, boulders up to 22 inches. And that, that, that's not what we want in a ground loop. So this was tough. Lower left shot, you see my wife standing near this pile, which became about 85 cubic yards of rubble that did not go through the grizzly screen. So, uh, you know, it's, it's on an alluvial plain. Uh, it's not meadow, meadow ground. So we jig, tie, and roll the, the HDPE pipe into slinkies, put it, roll in the donut, get ready to lift it gently into the trench. There we go. So we unroll it on top of a bed of very fine silt that I got from mine tailings that my excavating company had access to. And so we put down six inches underneath, and we put six inches over the top, we vibroplated it, then filled and used a sheep's foot. It's a lot of extra work, but what it gave us is very good contact between the pipe and the silt. It also gave us the ability for that silt to hold a lot of water. Remember that I'm in a coarse sand environment with a lot of rock. The water comes and just goes, see ya, and it's gone. So what we want to do is hold that in the silt, and as a result, we now have a heat exchanger in cross-section that is like a foot high, 42 inches wide, and the pipe is working. It's not grout as in a vertical borehole, but in horizontal, it's the best I could do here in this case. Okay, so it's fused together in the header pit by Frank there, uh, brought up in sleeves so that underneath the house, the foundation and so forth, if that ever had to be replaced, you don't have to destroy the house to be able to refeed some pipe. Comes up in the garage to the mechanical area that you see there on the other slide. We're in serious drought, we're 100 year dry, uh, really tough to draw heat through uh, poor dry soil. Uh, that's, yeah, okay, so here's what I did at the top. Uh, we redug the trenches, we put drain rock in, we put leach pipe in, the leach pipe was fed by 
gutter water, surface drainage, and so forth to keep things wet. So even though we're still 100 year dry in the soil and we're still way low on precipitation, we're about half normal where I live right now, um, I, every bit of water I can get, I get to the loop and keep it wet. Here's my performance in that loop and the high temperature starting in the heating season, not that I started heating in November 1st, but that's when I first started taking my test. Uh, my average out of uh, five runs on that date, 56.3, I think it was, so that's starting way higher than nameplate performance. I'm probably doing 5.2 COP, uh, maybe higher. Uh, we get to the low in January, where I'm still just 40.9. I'm going to call that 41, which is the standard test temperature, so I'm getting nameplate performance. And by March 21st, I've recovered to 45.7, and on Monday, I was at 49.7. So, you know, I'm, I'm back up out of the uh, out of the bottom of everything, and so uh, I'm, I'm getting nameplate performance, and I'm doing actually better than that. So, uh, you know, what what's the beef? So here's the solar. It's a standard set of panels. Uh, they're wired together in strings. They go into two 4,000 watt DC inverters. They feed my meter, and uh, there's a breaker space for that. And uh, I pay 4.29 on a net meter charge. Uh, here's the export on the far left on January 25th. Now, my panels are at 22 and a half degrees. That's favoring summer, certainly not winter. If you were putting panels in my area for thermal or PV and you wanted maximum, you'd put them at 40 degrees tilt. I'm at 22 and a half to match my roof, but in the summertime, that's when I want to export. Because if I push a kilowatt hour back to my utility between 1 and 7 p.m., I'm earning a credit of 34 cents. I can get behind that. That buys me over two kilowatt hours in the winter period. So I'm looking forward to May 1st because I'm going to generate a lot more credits. Come on. There we go. Okay, uh, so here's the comparison between this year and last year. Last year, November and December, you should know that the solar went in November 12th and we turned it on. So those, those months is, are influenced by December solar but all the other months are going to be net real comparisons. You can see that I've made dramatic reductions in what I've used, and the word just came in about three days ago on the mid-April billing, and my result is not 138, it's minus 260. So I'm coming up in the world and making my credits, and what I'm hoping for is zero net energy, no carbon by December 9th, which is my true update. So there's three plateaus to this. One is I don't owe them anything. Another is I earn back all of my net energy metering charges of around $50 a year. And the third plateau, if I could get it, is an even trade, kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour. What I generate out of the sky, power the heat pump, get the heat from the ground. But basically, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm even Stephen. I want to thank you for being here. California Geo is our organization, and I am Martin Energetics, and you can find me online anytime you want. Susan. Thank you. Anymore, we don't have that so much in society, so I think that's fantastic. Why would the CPC not allow thermal heat pumps as an AC and option? Because they give you those exemptions? The question is, why did the CEC okay. um, not allow that as an option? Is that okay? Yeah. For AC. Uh, they want software built that integrates with what they already have so that there's a computer-based model for accepting these as being adequately efficient and, and proving that they work effectively and they comply with Title 24. Uh, we are going to attend a meeting next month which is going to explore this idea a little further with them, and we're happy to partner with them to explore it. But I must say that heat pumps have been uh, discussed and proven as the most efficient thing uh, around for a long, long time. And I would prefer something that would work a lot more like the old prescription, uh, prescriptive approach in Title 24. If you do this and this and this, you're good. My equivalent of that today would simply be you're producing a house that's verified envelope loads. You're putting in nameplate performance geothermal heat pumps. You're going for zero net energy. Hey, have a nice day. Go get your permit. That's, that's the way I'd like it to be that simplified. And, uh, you know, if you, if you do the kinds of things that I've done, and it, you're going to hear more case studies today as being done commercial buildings. 
That's a that's a bigger mountain to climb. If it can be done in these areas, let's let's not worry about developing hundreds of thousands of dollars of software to prove something that we basically already know. Okay, well, I, but, so let me just kind of counter that a little bit. You talked a lot about the regulations for those and the Well, I think uh, you know the, part of the difficulty was identified earlier. TDV and the way that zero net energy is defined is where there's the rub. If we're in court and I'm a trial attorney, if I can define the issue the way I want before you can define the issue and on the opposing side, I got a better shot at the jury. Uh, you know, the definition means everything, and that's why we would like to make it as simple as possible. We'd like to make it energy neutral and no mucking around about time-dependent valuation. I believe in the, in the principle of TDV uh, as it applies to the utilities trying to keep voltage on the grid and so forth and adjusting rates to penalize users like me who, if we choose to use power at a certain time, it can be done through rates. We've been dealing with time-of-use rates for decades. I believe in them, I, I use them, I participated in them long before I had solar. Uh, adjustments can be made, but I don't think we ought to in build and construct the building stock based on something that is 